So um, let me give you a, a rather lengthy and laborious introduction to what we're going to be talking about. We're starting a new class on Baptist covenant theology, and I've wrestled pretty long and hard to explain what it is we're trying to do here and why it's so incredibly important. Um, the very, very short version is that we will be studying God's unfolding plan for humanity, which he has chosen to reveal through a covenant framework. Now, the challenge is to explain and motivate this and to do so. What? Paul's toner ran out. Can you work some magic? I don't, think I, don't, I don't think it is either. <clears throat> Let's just vote him in as the chief toner <laughs> person right now. Okay. So, challenge is to explain and motivate this when I see potentially multiple different kinds of people out there that very, very different groups of people when it comes to this particular topic. So I want to just kind of quickly go through these different groups and try to say something to, to you. And I'm not saying that every one of these groups is out here, but I, I suspect that most of them are. So group number one is the clueless group. Okay, don't raise your hand. You don't need to do that. Um, now, some of you are just clueless about what I mean by this topic, Baptist Covenant Theology, and, and that's not an insult, Okay. Um, if you're clueless, then I would say that you're in good company because you're probably in the same boat as 95% of Christians and 99.5% of non-Christians. If we didn't think that a lot of people here were clueless, we wouldn't be studying this. So don't worry about being clueless. But as I think about this, I think that it's important to actually break the clueless group up into two subgroups of cluelessness. And the, the first group of clueless is clueless but interested, okay? You're the kind of person who heard this term and you thought something, something like, well, uh, Baptist, that's a type of church, and that's the type of church we're in, and covenant, that's a word I've encountered in the Bible. I don't fully understand it, but it sounds interesting, and theology is the study of God, so sounds pretty good to me. I don't know exactly what those three words mean put together, but I'm, uh, I'm ready to learn, Okay? Well, first of all, let me say, if that's you, then you are my absolute favorite student. <laughs> In fact, I've got a, I'm going to reserve the front row for you if you'd like to sit on the front row. Um, I, I'm, I would, I'm most excited about a student like that, and I'm hope, hopeful that you won't be disappointed. Now, the second subgroup is a little bit different. That's a clueless but not interested Okay, you heard the words Baptist Covenant Theology and you thought, oh, how many weeks is this class? Um, I was really hoping for a class on building godly relationships or maybe a study of knowing God's will, something practical. And this just sounds dry and boring and, and abstract. So I want to say a couple of words of encouragement to you if you find yourself in that group. First of all, a covenant is essentially a strong relationship. It's the type of relationship that serves in the Bible as the foundation of all relationships. Hmm? There we go. Thank you. The assistant toner man. <laughs> all right. So it serves as the, as the foundation of all relationships, um, and um, it, is, it is the type of relationship that describes the relationship God has with his people. It is a description of the type of relationship between a husband and a wife. And so if you understand these things, then you will have the best possible foundation for building meaningful relationships. And not only that, but covenant theology lays a foundation for understanding God's law. And that's just another way of saying understanding God's will. So if you have a grasp of this topic, then you will understand the difference between what, what God requires of you now, what God required of people in the Old Testament, and also how you can be free to follow God's will with freedom and joy that only God can give. So that's to, to the clueless. Now, another group is possibly 
those of you who are coming from a dispensationalist background. For those of you who don't know, dispensationalism is a system that addresses some of the same questions that we're going to address here um, using the term covenant theology, okay? But it provides a very different set of answers to that. So if you're coming from that background, you may have heard that the term covenant theology is a bad thing, okay? You may have heard that covenant theology spiritualizes away the Old Testament and doesn't take the Bible literally, and that's a bad thing. You may have also heard that covenant theology leads to baptizing babies, and that's a bad thing, okay? So I have something to say to you. First of all, we're going to be looking at a lot of passages of Scripture, and we're going to be dealing with what those passages actually say and take them very literally. But we're also going to let the Bible teach us how to interpret the Bible. Now, doesn't that sound like a good approach? Let's let the Bible teach us how to interpret the Bible. <clears throat> and second of all, just so you don't become too alarmed, I've labeled this class Baptist Covenant Theology just to put you, give you a little sense of assurance that we're not going in the direction of baptizing babies, okay? That's a real major concern for you. Um, we're we're going to go in a little different direction from our Presbyterian friends who use this as a basis for baptizing their infants. We're not going to end up there, okay? So the third group of, is those of you who might be pedobaptists. Pedobaptist is another word for someone who believes in infant baptism. Um, maybe you or maybe some of the friends that you will bring along may think that Baptist covenant theology is an oxymoron. It's a seemingly self-contradictory term like jumbo shrimp or <laughs> compassionate conservative or something like that. <laughs> and so what I'm hoping is that you'll discover that confessional Baptists can and do embrace covenant theology, but, they, but we do so in a way that is entirely consistent with our view of the church and its membership. Okay? The fourth group that might be out there is neologians. You know, oh, neologian? What's that? Well, a neologian is like a theologian, but it's someone who prefers something new to deal with tensions in theology, especially if he think, can think of that new thing himself. All right? Now, I'm being a little bit funny here, but the truth is that there are various solutions that are being proposed these days to tensions, difficulties in covenant theology as well as dispensationalism, and some of the popular solutions today, one of them being new covenant theology, um, they have very little contact with historical theology and the discipline of church-based theological process. And so in this class, we're going to propose a solution to some of those difficulties, some of those tensions in covenant theology that I think is both satisfying biblically and thoroughly time-tested, Okay. So uh, just to kind of clean up, I thought of a couple of other groups. Maybe you're knowledgeable, but you're also hungry for greater clarity. Um, you're already committed to the basic ideas of what we're studying here, but you're ready to learn more. Uh, I don't think I need to motivate you. You're, you're, you're there and you're ready to go. Uh, another group possibly is that you're out there and you know more than I do about this topic. So all I would say is just pray for me that I will know better and you can help keep me on track. Um, I may have left out a few other groups, but uh, if I've left you out, I'm sorry. I, I tried. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll just go from here. But in the end, putting all these groups back together again, what I want to do is I want, to, I want you to have a clearer picture of the process that God is using to work out his redemptive purposes in history. I want you to have a clearer sense of what is going on right now in this present age what God is doing. And, and I want this to move you to worship and to marvel at the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. When Paul was looking at the sweep of redemptive history in Romans 9 through 11, that's, how he, that's what moved him to say that, to marvel at God's amazing plan. And so I hope that you'll uh, be moved to do that too. I hope you'll see a display of God's wisdom and glory in redemption like you've never seen before. And I ask that you would pray that the Spirit would grant me the skill to communicate this and grant that you would have the strength to comprehend 
with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love in Christ. I was expressing some, uh, I don't know, uh, nervousness, not, that's not the right word, but struggling a little bit yesterday to Debbie, and she was like, are you nervous? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm not really nervous. I'm, I'm just, I, I, this is such important stuff, and it's so good, and I'm afraid I can't uh, get that across to people as well as, as I would like to. So, I, so I'm, I'm very um, excited about the material. I'm not sure that I'm capable of translating what I'm seeing in my heart and mind in this to you, but pray that I would be able to. Pray that God will help, help us in that, okay? So this would be a good time to, to ask the Lord to bless our study. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that we can come together and open your word and that you've not left us in the dark. We're not simply blind participants in your plan, but you have brought us into your household as full-grown sons in the house of God, and you have privileged us with uh, some explanation of what you're doing. And we can, in a sense, look on the map and see you are here. We can see that, that we are at a certain place in redemptive history and know that you have a plan for us and that you've already been carrying out that plan for thousands of years. And, and Father, we want to look into that. and We want to marvel at your wisdom and your goodness. And I ask that by your spirit, you would help us to be able to do that. And that we wouldn't simply be equipped to uh, refute others better in controversy, but that we would be equipped to, to live out our lives before you in this age uh, with confidence of where you have put us now and, um, and with uh, a sense of, of your wisdom and goodness and glory in that. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so this is one of these topics that I think you kind of have to spiral into it. That is, you talk about it a little bit, and then kind of, you know, you can't define everything at the beginning and then move on from there, and you kind of have to keep circling back to different things. So let me just start off with a, a basic description of what we're trying to say here. Um, Baptist covenant theology teaches that God has revealed his dealings with mankind in terms of covenants. Okay, this is not something that, that I thought, okay, this is a good way to arrange this material. Okay, this is the way God has arranged the material, we believe. Okay, and I'm going to hopefully argue that a little bit more as we get into it. Um, we know that Adam broke God's covenant of life in the garden. And we'll look at that as to what, what was going on there and how that fits into the concept of a covenant. From that point, God has revealed his grace through a series of covenants, culminating in the new covenant that is made with all God's chosen people. Okay, so very, very short version of what we're going to be looking at. And I thought it would be helpful just to read the section of, um, of our confession of faith on this topic. Uh, chapter 7 says God's covenant, of, of God's covenant. I'm going to read for, to you from the modernized version. And this is not the only place where the, the uh, confession addresses this, but this is kind of the, the single point of focus. There's other places that also address the fuller aspects of it. <clears throat> okay? So, partly I'm reading this so to let you know that I'm not making this up. This has been around for a very, very long time. And, uh, and we're, we're looking at something that's very time-tested, uh, been around for a long time, is very well thought out and very well articulated. Okay? So it says, though rational creatures are responsible to obey God as their creator, the distance between God and these creatures is so great that they could never have attained the reward of life except by God's voluntary condescension. He has been pleased to express this through a covenant framework. Since humanity brought itself under the curse of the law by its fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace. In this covenant, he freely offers to sinners life and salvation through Jesus Christ. On their part, he requires faith in him that they may be saved and promises to give his Holy Spirit to all who are ordained to eternal life to make them willing and able to believe. This covenant is revealed in the gospel. It was revealed, first of all, to Adam in the promise of salvation through the seed of the woman. 
After that, it was revealed step by step until the full revelation of it was completed in the New Testament. This covenant is based on the eternal covenant transaction between the Father and the Son concerning the redemption of the elect. Only through the grace of this covenant have those saved from among the descendants of fallen Adam obtained life and blessed immortality. Humanity is now utterly incapable of being accepted by God on the same terms on which Adam was accepted in his state of innocence. Okay, So that's kind of a little fuller description of what this is about. So uh, my second point is that covenant theology is, is a framework that is derived from the Bible. If you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. And again, this is, like I said, this is a spiral, so we're going to look at things in, not in great depth or detail at first, but we'll kind of circle back to those things once we have a little bit of a sense of orientation of where we are and what the questions are. Hebrews chapter 8. Basically, this entire chapter discusses what we call the New Covenant, and particularly in contrast to what we sometimes call the Old Covenant. I want to just focus in on one verse, and we'll come back to this in in some detail later, not today, but later. Um, So he's contrasting the covenant over which Christ is the mediator to this Old Covenant. And again, if you remember the the kind of the general theme of the book of Hebrew, Hebrews is that it's the superiority of Christ over everything that came before. Okay, so in particular, now he's focusing on the superiority of the cry of the covenant over which Christ is mediator to previous covenants or the old covenant in particular. Okay, so he says in verse six, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is acted, enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. So then he goes on to talk about the uh, establishment of this second covenant. So not that there aren't other covenants mentioned in Scripture, um, but he kind of boils it all down in a big picture sense, to two, which he calls the first and the second one, or the old and the new, okay? So again, when you, when you kind of zoom in to look at in greater detail, you'll find that there are specific covenants that, that you could break those down into, particularly the old covenant, but, um, but in, in the big picture scheme of things, there are two covenants. There's the old covenant and the new covenant. And that gives us a framework for looking at the Bible and looking at what what the differences are and where we are in redemptive history, okay? And again, we will zoom in on more detail, but just walking away with that is helpful, just to understand that there was an old covenant that uh, is is in contrast to the newness and the goodness and the superiority of the new covenant. If you can walk away with that, you've gotten something pretty important in in this class, okay? Um, Also, if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Jesus uses the same terminology in the Lord's Supper. When he's, he's explaining to his disciples what they're doing and what it means. If you look at in Luke 22, verse 20, Jesus says, and, and likewise, the, 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 well, he says, and likewise the cup after they had eaten. Um, so let me pick up and not pick up in the middle of that. Um, he said, had said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Okay, so he uh, equates the new covenant to something that is enacted or inaugurated by his blood. Okay, that's the new covenant, which, of course, in contrast, 
the, the term new covenant contrasts to old covenant, right? Okay. Well, so we have those couple of uh, indicators, but also, what about this thing right here? If I want to start talking about the Bible, what would be one of the very first things I would say, other than the fact that it's inspired by God? Once I start explaining something about its structure, what would I say? It's divided into two testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. Do you know what the word testament is just a synonym for covenant? So uh, we recognize that the Bible itself is structured according to this two covenant structure, Old Covenant and New Covenant. The Old Testament means Old Covenant. And the New Testament, it means New Covenant. So the Old Testament is the revelation that defines and describes the Old Covenant. The New Testament is focusing on describing and defining the New Covenant. Okay, so we have even the structure of our Bible is there. And like I said, the, even though there are other covenants specifically mentioned in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant dominates the emphasis of the Old Testament. Okay, so that's, I think, helpful to us just as a starting point for our framework. Okay? All right. So now the third thing I want to do is, is give a definition of covenant. And these things aren't supposed to happen when you're... Okay. So what is a biblical covenant? By the way, in, in a number of places, and I, I'll... I, this never happens except in a presentation, does it? Um, um, I'm going to be leaning uh, quite a bit on uh, some of the material that uh, has either been published by Richard Barcelos or personally lent, lent to me by him. I appreciate that. And this is actually his definition of this. So the definition of a biblical covenant is that it is a relational arrangement initiated by God's sovereign dispensing of his kindness, his goodness, and his wisdom toward man. Okay, so we could kind of break that down and say that a biblical covenant, and there, there are other covenants in the world, okay? In fact, that I think we could even pick out some particular covenants in the Bible where their covenants were made between uh, individual men or, or nations. But what we're talking about is something specifically related to redemption here. Okay, so that's why I'm defining it this way. Um, also, I, I'll mention before I get into this that, that this concept of a covenant was a concept that was very well known in the ancient Near East during the time in which the, uh, the, the Old Testament and the, these covenants were being uh, revealed. So God providentially allowed this concept to develop among peoples at that time and used that concept as a vehicle to communicate his own relationship to his people that he was forming. Okay, So this was not just a brand new idea. It was something people would be familiar with when this term covenant was, was uh, used, okay? So a biblical covenant is a covenant that is initiated by God. Um, it's not something where um, we sit down at the table and we've got our negotiating points and God has his negotiating points and we say, well, I'll, I'm going to give a little bit on this one and if you'll just give a little bit on that one. And we come to some sort of a negotiated uh, set of terms. That's not the way it is. You don't do that with God. Okay, God comes, God says, this is the covenant, these are the terms, you are to accept these things. Okay, he's God and we are not. Okay, this is not like a, a contract or a pact between equals. There are no negotiations here. Okay, the second part of this is that it's for our good. It has a good purpose. God's covenants are not intended to... Uh, bring about a, a bad state for us or to put us at a disadvantage. See, we have a good God. And when he comes to make a covenant, then we ought to say, thank you, God. Thank you for making this covenant with me. 
Remember that it is just, it's simply a privilege. It's a covenant is a relational arrangement. It intensifies the relationship between the parties. And so it's a blessing just in itself that God would draw near and would choose to intensify his relationship with us through this arrangement that we call a covenant. So it has a good purpose. Um, divine covenants are the means through which God reveals his kindness, goodness, and wisdom to man. And so, uh, as Nehemiah Cox said, Nehemiah Cox is one of the, considered to be one of the co-editors of the 1689 Baptist Confession. He also wrote um, a, a very important work on, on uh, the covenants. And Cox says, the benefits God will bestow on man, the communion man will have with God, and the way and means by which this will be enjoyed by man, um, these are all the specific concerns of the covenants. So, then third, the third thing is conditions, sometimes with conditions. There are some covenants in which God simply says, this is what I'm going to do. He reveals his plan. He um, obligates himself, and there are absolutely no conditions on our part other than just to be thankful, and that's not a condition in a sense. Okay, um, We might label a covenant like that a covenant of grace. Undeserved, it has nothing, no, requires no response for it to happen. Okay. Then uh, there are some covenants in which there is a condition. There's something that, that we have to fulfill or the, the other party has to fulfill in order for the covenant, uh, con, uh, in, in order for the good or the blessing of the covenant to take place. And sometimes those are labeled a covenant of works. And we're going to talk about that language later on. But um, anyway, just to think of it as two different conditional and unconditional covenants. Okay? Um, If you would, then turn with me to Genesis 17. Just very, very briefly, I want us to see an example of a pretty fully developed biblical covenant. Genesis 17. And we won't unpack this or anything right now but just want you to see it, okay? Most of you are probably already familiar with this. But it says, when, uh, verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Okay, so uh, well, you might consider that to actually be a condition walk before me and be blameless, that I might um, do this, okay? But then there's also another very specific thing. He says, says, then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall, shall, excuse me, shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay? So let's just think for just a minute. What are the things that are being promised here? What is the good to Abraham? Tell me some goods. Okay, offspring. He's promising him offspring. A whole lot of offspring, right? Multiplying offspring. Land, the land of Canaan. Okay, anything else? To be their God. To be a God to him and to them. Okay, so those are the basic, the basic uh, goods that are being promised. And God said to Abraham... As for you, you shall keep my covenant. Okay, here we have conditions coming, a condition at least. You and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Okay, now I'm not going to go through all that um, after that, but basically that's the condition. Is that they, he, he must circumcise all the males according to God's direction and, then, and to continue to do that down through the generations, all right? So we see there, we see that it's initiated by God, 
Abraham didn't go to God and say, hey, I got this great idea for a covenant. He didn't, he didn't uh, negotiate with God and say, hey, how about, you know, could we make this one a little bit easier or something like that? Nothing like that. It was initiated by God. All the, the conditions, stipulations, uh, God's commitment, all that was um, revealed by God. It was for his good. It was to give him uh, uh, lots and lots of offspring, give him uh, a, a uh, land, and also to be his God. Okay. But in this case, it had conditions. There was, at the very least, the condition, the most obvious thing, the condition of circumcision that they had to be faithful at. Uh, at the beginning, it also says to walk before me and be blameless. So that might be considered a condition as well. So hopefully that illustrates for us <clears throat> the kind of thing we're talking about when we're talking about a biblical covenant. All right? So now, this seems a little bit odd. I struggle with this a bit, but now I want to talk about why this is important. You know, it, normally you talk about why something is important at the beginning. But if you think that a lot of people don't have a clue what you're talking about, then you can't talk about why it's important. So I had to spend a little bit of time talking about what it was before we could talk about the importance of the study. Okay? C.H. Spurgeon, the famous 19th century Baptist preacher, had this to say about the importance of understanding the covenants of Scripture. He said, The doctrine of the covenant lies at the root of all true theology. I am persuaded that most of the mistakes which men make concerning the doctrines of Scripture are based upon fundamental errors with regard to the covenants of law and grace. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? He went on to say, The covenant of works was, Do this and live, O man. But the covenant of grace is, Do this, O Christ, and thou shalt live, O man. And doesn't that give us some insight into the covenant of grace? Because the covenant of grace isn't free. In a sense, it is a covenant of works. It's a covenant of works to Christ. He had to do something, not us. Okay? And he fulfilled that. So that was Spurgeon's opinion about this kind of study. Who's going to argue with Spurgeon here? Okay? <laughs> Enough said, right? Okay. But we can say a few more things anyway. Um, second of all, it, it impacts our understanding of the gospel. Okay? We need to, we, natural questions are, what exactly did Christ do for us? What was it that Christ had to do? And we have a very basic understanding of, okay, he had to die for us. But we're going to find that, that there's a much richer understanding of what Christ had to do if we understand the covenants, especially the covenant of works. Okay? What did Adam fail to do? Again, that's important to understand what Christ did because they're kind of parallels and anti-parallels in a way. Okay? How did Christ become a legitimate substitute for us? How is that possible? This addresses some of those kinds of questions. Also, our, our understanding of the covenants impacts our understanding of the law. And so it, under, it impacts our understanding of God's will. So how does the law apply to us today? And are some parts of the law done away with in Christ? These are things that this study can address. Also, our study of, of covenant theology displays the goodness of God in entering into relationships with people. That's, that's good in itself, simply to have a relationship with our creator. He's not standing off at a distance. He's saying, I will be a God to you. Okay? I, will, I will come in intimate relationship with you. I will join myself with you. I will, I will obligate myself to you in ways that go beyond simply the fact that he made us. All right? It also impacts our understanding of the church. Is the church, by design, a mixed body of believers and unbelievers? There are some churches that will say that, that that is God's design, that churches will be a mixture 
of believers and unbelievers, of renewed people and unrenewed people? Um, or is the church, by definition, a body composed of the saved, where that definition at least uh, determines the way we attempt to uh, gather as the people of God? Okay? And then another thing is that uh, this, this kind of study will impact our interpretation of Scripture. And, it, and a good illustration of that is what we talked about last week when we were talking about Psalms. How do we understand what's going on in Psalms? Well, part of what we do is we understand it was, it was written and expressed in an Old Covenant context. And so the terminology, the outlook, uh, the, the place of, of what has been accomplished so far in redemptive history, all those things drive the way we read the Psalms and the way we interpret the Psalms today. Okay, so that's just one example of how um, this study can affect our interpretation of Scripture. It helps us to understand the flow of Scripture and what's, what's moving from one place to another, and it helps us to understand prophecy better as well, if we understand where God is headed, so to speak, in what he's doing. Okay, now I have a, a, on my outline here some terminology, which I'm not going to go over, but that's just for you to read at another time. You're not supposed to look at it right now because that would be distracting, right? Okay, but I knew I wasn't going to have time for that, so uh, but we will probably use some of those terms, and there will be a test on it at the beginning of the next class. Okay. <laughs> All right, so finally, I want to show you this diagram. I had to get to this diagram because I spent about 47 hours trying to put it together with Adobe Illustrator. And so it would have been an absolute tragedy. You know, I didn't have time to actually prepare the class. I just prepared the, the diagram. And um, I found out that, you know, it's a whole lot easier to consume a diagram than it is to create one. Man, even a simple one like that. So anyway, but maybe the next one won't be so hard. So I just wanted to give you just a very brief idea of, of what this structure looks like from the perspective that I'm going to be approaching it here. Okay, so um, I haven't really practiced on how to talk through this, but um, so to begin with, we'll see, and, and this is something we read in the confession, that all of this is sort of based on a, a, a plan that God had within the Trinity in eternity past to redeem a people for himself. So that's why I have this little arrow saying, pointing to eternity past and saying, calling it the covenant of redemption within the Trinity. Um, Okay, so at the beginning, we have, um, what, uh, uh, we have creation, we have the, the um, condition that God gave to Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? And next week, we're going to look at that in, in some detail, and I'm going to argue that that was actually a covenant that God made with him. And even though we see the curse of the covenant, I'm going to argue that he made it for, for Adam's good and for the good of his posterity, okay? But he failed. He broke the covenant, and, and along with uh, uh, covenant stipulations, generally comes covenant curses if you fail, if you break the covenant. The parties to the covenant have obligations, and if the, there, there's a failure, then their curses come about. So a curse came about, and, uh, and the fall took place, and that affected all of us, right? Again, we'll talk about that in more detail later. And so then we have, immediately after that, God uh, uh, um, appears to Adam and Eve, Genesis 3.15, and he gives them the promise that there's this uh, skull-crushing seed to come that's going to crush the seed, crush the, the serpent's head, okay? That is a, we understand to be a, a, a glimpse of God's redemptive work in the future um, upon which they could hope um, for forgiveness, for redemption. Okay, so, so we see th th this is why the little gray thing is kind of starting off small because it was just barely visible at that point. And also it was only in the form of a promise. Okay, no covenant was made at that point. It was simply a promise. And, and so th what we see is, is the covenant, what we call the, the new covenant or the covenant of grace, 
is something that is being revealed progressively through the Old Testament. And it's becoming clearer and clearer as we go along, but it's not actually enacted. Okay, and this is where I think some versions of covenant theology get it wrong. They say that the Old Covenant is the covenant of grace, but the covenant of grace is not enacted yet. It doesn't get enacted. It doesn't, it's not established until Christ died. Okay? So, the, so we're, the, the covenant is future, and it has benefits even to Old Testament believers, kind of retroactively back to Old Testament believers. Maybe that's not the right way to describe that. But, um, but it has benefits sort of as a down payment for what's to come. Okay? But it hasn't yet been enacted. The Old Covenant, in a sense, is kind of like a container for what God is doing, all right? It's a, it's a, it's a structure that God places that has, in, you, we see that the, there's an outward people of God, but, you know, of course, the history of Israel demonstrates that, that many, if not most of them, were not believers. They weren't uh, faithful to the Lord. And yet, in some sense, they, they were the people of God, at least in terms of, of foreshadowing the people of God in the new covenant, okay? So, so we have that aspect of things, too. So the old covenant is put in place primarily, or it comes to sort of its zenith in, under Moses and uh, the covenant of Sinai and uh, the temple system and the all the ceremonial laws and all that stuff. Um, and that becomes the container for revealing the covenant of grace. It also becomes a means of revealing the, the uh, covenant of works. That is that you can't keep God's, all of God's law up until God changes you. In fact, we need, we're continually reminded that we need a Savior because of the burdensome nature of the Old Covenant, okay? So that's kind of the, the structure that we're going to be studying, and uh, hopefully we're going to zoom in on that and not look at it at uh, such a distance. So I have a high-resolution version of that for when we zoom in. <laughs> okay, all right, I, I know I've gone over a little bit, but do we have any questions here? Because I, I realize this is kind of a broad thing, and just let me remind you that we've got seven more weeks to answer a lot of detail questions. I'm talking about sort of general orientation questions. Okay. Adam? Um, you talk about a covenant being God promising good, basically. So could you talk a little bit about how that's, why we make a distinction between that and the many times, for example, in the prophets where God says, if you continue on this path, bad things will happen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good, good question. Well, see, all of the, what they're doing is they're kind of like lawyers coming to the people and saying, look, the covenant was already signed. You're in covenant with God. You are failing to live up to the covenant promises, I mean, covenant stipulations. You are calling down the curse of the covenant upon yourself because you're failing to live up to the covenant. So it's very much in a covenant framework. That they're, they're coming as, as saying, you know, we've got a, 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 an agreement here. And you're not living up to it. You're, you're, you're on the path of, of failure, of curse. And, you know, you continue on that path, you'll be cut off. And, of course, they ended, they were eventually because they failed. Um, but then could you talk about how, for example, Jonah going to Nineveh to uh, pronounce a curse against them was just a sign of failure? Wow. I'll have to think about that one. I, I'm not sure I can answer that off the top of my head. Oh, really? Is 31 saying they went to another village or something like that? <laughs> wow, I can't. Yeah, that's one. That was what I meant. I, I did. I worked so hard to get come up with a verse on that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, 
man, actually, I, and I almost didn't put a verse there because it's like the, the new covenant is not enacted in a moment. It's kind of over a series of things where, you know, is it, is it enacted when Jesus died or when he was resurrected, when he was ascended? You know, so you can't put a specific point on it, but I just thought I'd throw a verse in and I got it wrong. So, oh, well. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? All right, well, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can study these things and see the, the, the sweep and the, the uh, scope of your plan for your people. And I ask that you'd continue to help us, Father, to, to understand these things and put these things together and get a, a clearer understanding of some of the, the loose threads that we uh, encounter in Scripture simply because we haven't uh, been able to put it together into a a framework that we can remember and understand. And I ask that you'd help us to be able to do that better, um, that it would all lead to a greater uh, understanding and appreciation for your work uh, with your people and of your glory that we might be moved to worship you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.